Hello, everyone, and welcome to another video on our own devices. I'm Jean Messi, and I'm continuing my process of splitting up my older grab bag episodes into shorter standalone videos. And today we're going to be looking at a fascinating miniaturized version of a type of device that we previously looked at in another video. So you recall that a little less than a year ago, I covered the weird and wonderful world of medical coils, high voltage, high frequency electrical transformers used in the now largely defunct practice of electrotherapy, using electricity to cure various ailments. And I say largely defunct because a couple of these applications were actually found to be medically valid. So for example, diathermy, the use of radio frequency currents for deep tissue heating, and transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation, or TENS, are both widely used today in physiotherapy. Now, medical coils came in all sorts of shapes and sizes, from large elaborate models mounted in wooden cabinets for use in doctor's offices and hospitals, to more portable units known as home batteries or domestic batteries, all the way down to tiny pocket-sized versions like this one. And this is what we're going to be having a look at today. So this is a pocket battery number one, produced by the Barclay Manufacturing Company of New York, Philadelphia, and Boston sometime in the late 19th or early 20th century. Now, the only Barclay Manufacturing Company I was able to find other references to was a toy manufacturer founded in Hoboken, New Jersey in 1922, famous for their lead soldiers and die-cast cars. So they're unlikely to have been the company that produced this unit. However, this basic design was also produced by at least one other company, the Whittall Tatum Company of Millville, New Jersey, which was a major manufacturer of laboratory and medical glassware, which makes a lot more sense. Now, the design of this device dates back to 1879, being patented by one Louis Drescher on November 4th of that year. Another patent associated with this device was awarded to one G. Otto on March 20th, 1888, and covers the little plugs used to connect the coil to the application electrodes. Now, despite being so small, this unit incorporates all the same basic components as the larger medical batteries that we've covered, in particular, the induction coil itself, which has a primary winding on the inside and a secondary winding on the outside with a larger number of turns to step up the voltage supplied by the battery. And on one side of the coil, we have another vital component, which is the interrupter. When the coil is energized, it produces a magnetic field that attracts this little reed switch, breaking the contact, collapsing the magnetic field, and causing the reed switch to snap back into place, completing the circuit, re-energizing the coil, and starting the cycle over again. And this produces an oscillation with a constantly varying magnetic field that allows the induction coil to operate. Now, I wasn't able to find any information on the output of this coil, but typically medical coils produced around 20,000 volts at 200 hertz, which is around the maximum frequency that can be achieved by a mechanical interrupter. Now, on the other side of the coil, we have a little sliding core that allows you to adjust the current. So this works by adjusting the inductance of the coil, and the higher the inductance, the lower the current. Most coils like this will use a core made of a ferrous metal like iron, which having a high magnetic permittivity increases the inductance of the coil. So sliding the core in decreases the current, sliding it out increases the current. This coil, however, uses the opposite approach and has a core made of a non-ferrous metal, in this case copper, which having a low magnetic permittivity decreases the inductance and thus increases the current. So sliding the core in will increase the current, sliding it out will decrease the current. And you can see that this consists of an inner core made of a rolled sheet of copper and an outer core, which is a copper tube plated in some sort of silvery metal, probably chromium. Now, the output of the coil comes out through these two terminals, and these are connected to the application electrodes via those plugs that I mentioned, which were patented by G. Otto. Now, unfortunately, this unit is missing its plugs and its associated wires, as well as one of its application electrodes. And that electrode would have been slightly smaller so that the two could telescope together for storage. Now, the original patent by Louis Drescher includes a design for a roller type application electrode, but there's no indication that I could find that these were ever manufactured or sold. But by far the most interesting and rather baffling feature of this entire system is the power source, which is an open wet cell battery. More specifically, this is a version of the Marie Davy cell, which was invented in the early 1850s by the French chemist and inventor Edmé Hippolyte Marie Davy. 
and was briefly used by the French post office and French troops in the Crimean War to power telegraphs. A development of the earlier Bunsen cell, the Marie Davy cell, had an anode made of compressed carbon, a cathode made of zinc amalgamated with mercury, and an electrolyte composed of a concentrated solution of mercury bisulfate. And if we remove the carbon anode from this battery, we can see that it connects to the rest of the circuit via this spring clip. And running through the middle is a metal post that is electrically insulated from the cup by a sleeve of hard rubber. And the top of that post is sharpened so that our cathode can be balanced on top. And to power this unit up, you actually had to mix up your own electrolyte, which according to the instruction label inside the lid, you did by filling the cup halfway with water and mixing in two spoonfuls of mercury bisulfate, the spoon being provided with the battery. And this chemical was widely available in any pharmacy as an emetic for inducing vomiting. Now, an interesting detail here is that if we flip over the anode cup, we'll see that it is stamped FG Auto and Sons of New York. This is the same FG Auto that submitted the patent for those little electrical connectors. Other markings to point out here include the patent date here, November 4th, 1879, as well as the serial number, which is 2571. Though this doesn't necessarily mean that that many of these units were produced because a lot of companies at this time tended to start their serial numbers at a thousand or even higher to give the impression that more units had been produced and sold than actually were. And then at the end, we have P and N indicating the positive and negative terminals of the coil. And then handwritten on the label, we have a price of $3.50, which, assuming this was manufactured and sold around 1900, is equivalent to around $128 today. But going back to the circuit itself, to me, the idea of powering a pocket electrical device with an open wet cell battery is really kind of wild because in between uses, you would have to be very careful to drain and wipe out all traces of electrolyte. Otherwise, any remaining traces and the fumes produced by that residue would quickly start eating away at your pocket and the rest of your clothes. And indeed, I'm very lucky that this particular unit is in such great condition because in a lot of examples I found for sale online, the label inside the lid has been completely eaten away by the fumes from the battery. But still a fascinating little piece of electrical and medical history. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time in another video where we'll look at yet more medical gadgets and other fascinating devices just like this one. Until then, I'm Jean Messier from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.